I'm going to make my comments pretty short and to the point here this morning. Uh, I am John Fallon. I'm the current president of the Public Lands Council, and I'm also a member of the Mustang Heritage Foundation Board of Trustees. And while I'm talking about the Board of Trustees for a minute, uh, I know that these funds are short. I know that uh, there's going to be a, quite a bit of competition in, in divvying up these funds. But today, it seems to me like with all the things we got going here, the most important thing we can do right now is to make sure that this adoption program stays alive and well. And in order to do that, and you heard the report yesterday from Patty, and we need desperately to make sure that you folks recommend to the BLM that this adoption program is, is fully funded because we're ready to go. We can adopt out uh, 4,000 horses, and, and that's a positive step to doing what you folks need to do. Getting back to that, uh, Renee, uh, when she was asking questions of you folks this morning, she made a really, really good point. And the point, of course, was that uh, this, fer this uh, fertility program is going to be behind the curve here because they're going to start with a, not gathering these horses and it, you know the fertility program is going to be two years out. And so we're going to get behind in the next two years substantially. And it seems to me like we ought to reverse that order and get, keep up with the adoption program at all costs until we find out if this fertility program and these other measures that we got going are actually going to work because it's really hard to catch up and and you guys all know that and you know and Wayne uh, hit it right on the head when he said that it's uh, the same thing exactly you know it, it's hard to catch up from behind and uh, we need to we need to stay right with this program and we need to match the the uh, the uh, the adoption rate with the number of horses on the public land. In other words, the, the rate of increase need not to exceed the number of horses we got on the public land. And that's a really valid point. I want to say a little bit about the Salinar, Salazar in, uh, Initiative. I think, uh, and, and it's been alluded to here several times with speakers before me, but we got some serious problems there. And I think, uh, you know, right now we're in the in this comment period yet, and that'll last for the rest of this month. And then the BLM has to come out with their final decision. And after they get the final decision to us, then we're going to have to analyze that. And I think there's a really strong chance that we, as a public land council, a lot of our allies that are supporting us are probably going to have to One take a minute. look at this. From a, from a legal challenge. The last thing I wanted to mention a minute was uh, wildlands issue we got presented with just before Christmas. And the same thing applies there. I think uh, when we get all our facts together, that is also going to have to be met with a, with a legal challenge. We're not there, but we're getting there. The last thing that I want to say is that uh, in reference to your new, whoever it is, the wild horse and burrow person to take Don Glenn's place needs to be somebody that is seasoned, somebody that is knowledgeable out here in the West and knows what's going on in the management of these wild horses. We don't need somebody there that we in the industry have to train. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Rick? Oh, and after Rick will be R.T. Fitch. Uh, Filch. Fitch? Fitch. I want to thank the board for giving me time to make a few comments. My name is Rick Myers, and I'm here to represent the ranching community in the state of Wyoming. Uh, to begin with, we, we use both private and federal land to graze our livestock. Uh, we are kind of disappointed right now with the proposal of the BLM to leave 24% of the horses above AL, AMLs out of, out of the roundups for the next two years. In addition, the BLM is giving in to spending over a million dollars to, re 
review the management procedures for the last decade or more just to gain the trust and credibility for the radical horse groups, which does not make sense. Please our hold question, comments. Our question is why is the BLM going into these horse advocate, giving into these horse advocates rather than just managing horses on the federal lands in a way they are capable of doing. For the last 10 years, the BLM has been doing a very good job of managing the horse population in our state. We ask that the BLM continue to manage the range lands with the authority deemed through the Federal Lands Act <coughs> using scientific as well as and not using scientific methods rather than just emotional influence from advocate dr groups the ranchers of wyoming don't want to completely remove the wild horse from the western range they just need to be managed along the livestock and wildlife in a way <coughs> to have a positive balance for the grazing of our range lands and let it be known that the wild horse in our area, we really, it is a heritage to us. We were raised with it. We've had it all our lives. So uh, that's about all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, R.T. Fitch is next. And yes, if you could use the microphone so we can all hear you. And after R.T. is Susan Sutherland. Thank you. I'd like to apologize to the board for wearing my hat in the house. My mama taught me better, but I was suffering from some serious hat envy here. <laughs> my name is R.T. Fitch, and my wife and I have traveled here at our own expense, just as many people behind us, to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. Besides being a hardworking American who more than pays, pays his fair share of taxes, I also voluntarily sit on the board of directors for Habitat for Horses. Likewise, I serve as the volunteer executive director of Habitat for Horses Advisory Council. Although my name may not be familiar to you, the name of Habitat for Horses should ring a bell as you spoke of us yesterday as we are involved in legal litigation against the BLM over the outrageous practice of zeroing out long-standing wild horse herds. It is a matter of public record that our legal hook is that the BLM uses bad data, poor math, and junk science, and I respectfully in personally have to thank the BLM for proving our case yesterday with a webcast presentations of arbitrary figures, unsubstantiated numbers with rumor and conjecture used as the basis to set forth policy and procedure. But there was one good and welcoming number that was thrown out, one that America should rejoice in, at least for the short term, and that is the fact that the agency is poorly funded and cannot afford to finance the deadly and unnecessary roundups of our national icons during the remainder of fiscal year 2011. That's why we are here. We want the roundups to stop, to cease, as it has already been proven that the system is broken and does not work. So on the surface, it appears that we may be gaining by default a portion of what we collectively are asking for. But the questions remaining are, and I ask this of the board, is the BLM going to take advantage of this breather? Will the BLM seize the moment and partner with the professionals and experts who have volunteered to assist with taking an accurate accounting of what is really left on the range and how many horses we actually have in holding? Will the BLM work with a consortium of qualified organizations in formulating a humane and workable management plan? I don't know. It would seem to a logical mind that that would be the thing to do. And as an advisory board, it would likewise appear that there would be an opportunity for dialogue on this issue. It is also obvious that the ball is in your court and the eyes of American taxpayers are on you in hopes that you make the right recommendations. But respectfully, allow me to be perfectly clear that besides the people who are present here in this room and the thousands who are viewing this webcast, there is a groundswell of discontent growing amongst the American public that we have had enough of the waste, the pain, the suffering, and the ignorance. We want the roundups to stop. So the ball's in your court. For the sake of the wild horses and burros, please don't drop it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Susan Sutherland, and after Susan is Marta Williams. 
Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to address the advisory board. Um, it's encouraging, certainly, to hear that new and different ideas are being considered, and we certainly look forward to uh, some successful implementation of, of some changes over time. Uh, and I want to also commend the efforts to um, in increase the adoption rates in the, um, in the Mustang makeover efforts. My comments are a bit general with respect to the strategy. Uh, they relate to the stakeholders, uh, but that, of course, does relate back to the strategy ultimately. Uh, I start with most wild horse and burrow advocates just want an equitable, as in a fair deal, for the wild horses, and this will be based on science and the law, I would add. The wild, and ho the wild horses and burrows have been driven off millions of acres of legally rightful land and in more and more cases rounded up to genetically non-viable herd sizes. Whether everyone admits to it or not, livestock, mining, and energy special interests or extractors lobby their own agendas to the government, the agencies, including the BLM, to persuade behavior, including the removal of wild ones from their legally deemed lands. After the massive roundups of the past two years, wild horse and burrow numbers on the range are well below what the BLM currently states, uh, but the extractors want more. I have nothing personal against the cattle industry, for example, but in the case of those public land ranchers that vilify wild horses, advocates mm -hmm. do take issue. The National Cattlemen's Association bylaws refer to wild horses as feral, which is scientifically incorrect, but one of their stated reasons for removal from public lands. Negative references and calls for wild horse removals are also discussed at Cattlemen's Public Lands Committee meetings where the BLM is represented. Now, it's understandable that BLM is present to discuss public land issues, but what's less clear or understandable is why a high percentage of such uh, a recent meeting, for example, focused heavily on wild horses versus other relevant range issues. And in comments from uh, my friend Ed Roberson at the BLM, he referred to the wild horse advocates at a recent meeting, this was, uh, wild horse advocates' communications as an echo chamber and spammers, while then referring to the public land ranchers as part of the team. So that strikes me as a bit curious, and I think uh, it's quite clear that there's lots of responsible advocates that are more than willing to be part of a constructive team. It's also very curious that we observe roundups deemed to remove so-called excessive horses based on available range or conditions only to have cattle move in after the horses are removed. So it's a matter of wanting more land at the expense of legally roaming horses as if public lands are a simple entitlement. And the multiple use excuse seems to mean use by merely multiple cattle in many cases. One minute. In addition, public land ranchers pay only a fraction of the market value of grazing, ergo the welfare ranching term, and they vigorously fight any increase in these fees despite record cattle prices. Yet, cattlemen publicly oppose private proposals to home wild equids, such as Madeline Pickens' plan, and they openly support slaughter. Bottom line, public land ranchers are subsidized to do what they want to do. They support and encourage the BLM to remove many horses as possible. Uh, which leads, as you know, to the millions of dollars in taxpayer funds. More and more Americans are learning about the inequity in the treatment of wild equids relative to livestock and the associated cost to taxpayers. There are thousands of wild horse and burrow advocates that find it unfair and fiscally wrong, and there are millions of uh, additional Americans who are taxpayers who are finding out as well. As national awareness continues to grow and as Americans call for more fiscally responsible government, welfare ranching will become increasingly visible to more Americans that are not subsidized. So continuing to support the demise of a public good, as in our revered wild horses and burrows, could ultimately be quite negative for an industry over time. Wild horse and burrow advocates will continue their efforts for awareness and fiscal reform as long as the wild ones are under attack from special interests. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Marta Williams? Maybe she's not here. After Marta would be um, Ginger Cathrius. If I got, <coughs> sorry if I. Cath, Ginger Cathras. Hi, I'm uh, Ginger Catherines. I'm a one of the uh, radical advocates. 
who comes before you today. I've been uh, here, coming here for 12 or 13 years, haven't I, Robin, ever since we started the advisory boards back up, and sometimes it feels like Groundhog Day to me when I come to these meetings. Um, but there are uh, certain things that, uh, that are changing. And I do thank the board for allowing us uh, all to come here and speak to you uh, today. Um, I speak on behalf of um, the Radical Cloud Foundation, <laughs> uh, Front Range Equine Rescue, the Equine Awareness Alliance, the Colorado Wild Horse and Burrow Coalition, and our thousands of supporters here in the United States and around the world. Um, it's, be it's been, what, nearly nine months, I think, um, or perhaps more than nine months since we've had an advisory board meeting. I think uh, your, your, your chapter statutes, or whatever they're called, I think uh, mandate two meetings a year. Um, I'm not sure if, um, if that's uh, something that I, I would recommend um, that we try to have more meetings in which uh, the public uh, can come and, and express our opinion. So that's a recommendation I would make to the board. I do uh, uh, hope to meet uh, Paul and Tim and uh, I'll let you know how radical and weird we are. Um, since the removal of uh, Cloud's family and herd mates, and he's a, he's a wild stallion who I've documented from birth. He's going to be 16 years old, May 29th. I know all of you will wish him a happy birthday. Um, he lives wild in the Pryor Mountains, but uh, uh, much of his family and, and herd were removed in September of 2009. Uh, since that time, the public has grown more informed, more involved, and more frustrated over the callous and unnecessary removals of these animals from their homes all over the West. And uh, this is why we are here, many of us, collectively and unified in our message that we are delivering, and that stop the roundups now. <clears throat> Temporarily, at least, uh, so that we can assess where we are, so we can all come to the table <clears throat> and make our recommendations and discuss how we move forward with this program. I would like to point out um, that I do agree with sustainable uh, herds, but I would also point out that a genetically non-viable herd is not a sustainable herd. Um, I would also like to point out that when the first census was made of wild horses and burros in the United States, uh, after the passage of the Wild Horse and Burrow Act in 1971, that first assessment said that there were 54,000 wild horses and burros on public lands. And uh, there were over 5,000 burros alone. Uh, we believe that there's far fewer than that now, probably less than half that number. Um, one minute. One minute, okay. Uh, we'd like to uh, say that we, we too embrace fundamental change, but I do not believe that fundamental change is a word on a piece of paper. Fundamental change means action, and actions speak louder than hollow rhetoric. But it's never too late to do the right thing, in our opinion, and we think now is the time. We embrace true reform within the Bureau of Land Management, a new, transparent, and accountable wild horse and burrow program that takes its lead from the sincere wishes of the vast majority of American citizens and taxpayers. A fair share of public lands grazing for wild horses and burros, and an immediate stop to these slipshod, unnecessary, costly, and unfortunately lethal roundups. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ginger. Next up is Susan Rudnicki, and after Susan, it's uh, Denise Constantine. Sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Hi, I'm Susan Rudnicki. Um, I currently live in Los Angeles. However, I grew up on a 10,000-acre cattle ranch in the sand hills of Nebraska. So I do have a lot of experience with bovines and equids, and it, it does give me some perspective on this issue. Um, I wish to say some remarks regarding the AMLs and the strategy issue regarding allocations of forage. For I believe that in the current modern setting, and this is changing rapidly with the energy scenarios that haven't been mentioned too much, but do impact the public lands. Within this AML de determination is the thorny issue of the word excess, which is a scientific term, hopefully, because it's based on the um, uh, allocations 
uh, determined by the number of animals actually there. Following the law, as had been per uh, and we have been firmly reminded here, is a subject to this notion of excess. Up to now, as the OIG report um, indicated in April of 2010, the DOI has never had a scientific integrity policy, and this is very troubling to me because I believe that we have to operate from science, so we've got to get that going in a much more uh, prescriptive way. The definition of excess needs to be resubjected to strict scientific scrutiny, otherwise all these things that we're talking about um, just don't have a real basis in fact. As has already been pointed out, it's quite impossible for some animals to reproduce at a 100% fertility rate. So how can taxpayers and other stakeholders feel confident in the BLM's determination of how many people, I mean, how many horses and burrows they're going to remove or how many are out there? This is a real problem. Um, finally, I would like to say that those of us co cognizant of the many issues in this debate want to mention an aspect not mentioned significantly, and this comes under sage grouse habitat or pronghorn animal, uh, antelope habitat, anything else, that other wildlife sharing issues are going to be subject to this elephant in the living room, as I would call it, um, the resource extractive industries. These are all asking for access to our public lands as well. Mining of metals, fracking of natural gas, solar and wind arrays, oil pipelines from Canadian tar sands. These industries often owned by foreign corporations, I might remind you, are co huge consumers of the scarce water resources in a very arid land. They are all impacting the public lands, not just the grazing animals or the wildlife or the people hunting for animals. These um, industries often re receive taxpayer subsidies. There's another in uh, problem for taxpayers. And they're causing significant stress to wildlife of all sorts. So this is just another thing that's on the table that we need to understand is making uh, um, a push on what's available on the public lands. It's not just horses and burros and cows and sheep. There's a lot of other uh, big, big players in the room, and they have very strong lobbying efforts. So I would ask you to consider that in terms of the AML and the, what, what different grazing animals are going to get. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Denise Constantinid. Thanks. And after Denise will be Carla Bowers. Hi, everyone. Um, as of June 2010, the Ridgecrest Society as of June 2010, the Ridgecrest facility in California seems to be uncooperative in supplying tip horses to qualified tip trainers. Uh, hopefully, Art can be more helpful uh, with the trainers and the Mustang Foundation. Um, also, I believe that the cost per head per month for welfare or cattle needs to be brought up to the proper cost. Um, equal to what the other ranchers have to pay when their cattle is grazed on their own private land. The taxpayers and the wild horses and burros are carrying the welfare cattle on their backs. Also, I'd like to find out or make a comment, I don't think it's right, why horses have been removed from the antelope complex and at the same time, hundreds of cattle are being brought into the very same land that the horses have been moved off on. That's it. Thank you very much. So Carla Bowers, and after Carla is Paula Carr. Hi there. Uh, I'd like to just bring in some perspective to this discussion, because I'm so disturbed about the numbers. And uh, I think that still the, uh, the whole program is so unfair to the wild horses and burros that are supposed to be national treasures of this country. Um, I like to look at the big picture of things, so just briefly, I want to share that uh, to add to what Simona said about 2% of America is all we're asking for, for these wild horses and burros. We have 1 to 3 million livestock that graze uh, BLM lands. We have 2 million mid-sized to large-sized game animals that graze the public lands. We only have, if we're lucky, 20 to 30,000 wild horses and burros today. This is insane that we are making this big of a deal about a tiny fraction 
a tiny number of horses and burros compared to millions of head of cattle and big game and mid-sized uh, wildlife on our public lands. This is insane. We only have, if, the, if you use an AML of 26.6 for wild horses and burros, it's like that's ridiculous. That's like endangered species level. Um, we may have 3,000 burros out there. That is totally an endangered species level uh, for any species to survive. That's a ridiculous number. Uh, there is a 70,000 bighorn sheep in this country. That's considered a species of concern by the wildlife community. So you're going to tell me and the American people that 26,600 horses and burros is too much or 38,000 is too much? I'm sorry. It does not fly. We must look at these numbers and be serious about reform here. Um, the AMLs for our wild horses and burros need to be raised so that they are at a sustainable level for long-term survival. That's it in a nutshell. We do not, if we go down to that number, we are not going to have sustainability long term. This is just facts. And I want to just add to the grazing, uh, the discussion about the grazing. Nobody put in the numbers here. We are subsidizing cattle grazing on the public lands to the tune of $123 million to $500 million a year of taxpayer money. We have to look at this, people. This is not the arc ages anymore. Um, the wildlife, I want to address the wildlife that people have said, oh, the wildlife are being, you know, they don't get, have the water, the, the horses are ruining and the blah, blah. Yes, excuse me. The wildlife have 650 million acres to roam on in this country. They have, they have free reign of all the public lands and the private too. And we have our horses on 26 million acres and you're going to tell me we have to look out for the wildlife? This is ridiculous. I love the wildlife, but we need to give our horses and burros their fair share, please. Uh, the, the livestock have 240 million acres to, to roam on uh, of BLM and U.S. Forest Service lands. Um, and I want to also stress that we here come on our own dime. We are not profit driven. We ask you, just for the sake of these wild horses and burros, we, don't, we are not profit driven. Everybody else who wants to use our public lands are profit driven. So we come from a place to really care about these animals and what's in the best interest of these animals. The, all, all the other interests, they just want money. Now, I'm not talking, I'm not going to speak to the, uh, to the strategy today. I wanted to give you some recommendations about the NAS study because I believe the NAS study is, is not going to be helpful or useful at all. But I, I'm running out of time. I will, I will actually email these to you and, and get them to you by... Uh, whatever source I can because I think they're very important. I didn't know the four minutes was going to run up this fast, but uh, we do. We need to stop the roundups because we don't know how many horses are out there. We need a census right now today, not two years from now when the NAS decides what the modeling program is. We can do forward-looking infrared censusing right now today, and we can figure out every single animal that's out there, whether it's a horse, a sheep, a cow, a deer, an elk. We have it. Thank we you. have the technology today. Please, please advise the BLM to do that right now. Thank you. Thank you. Af after Paula Carr is Carolyn Fulon. Here. Good morning. Um, since August of uh, 15th, 1979, my husband and my working par partner have won bids uh, that contracted with the BLM adoption program. Being the first center in the East, we were considered the guinea pig facility. BLM wanted to see if the folks that were east of the Mississippi would give these wild horses and uh, burros good homes. Going into the project, we hardly knew what to expect, so we built our facilities eight foot tall and very strong WW panels. First shipment came to the farm with the news media and the crowds of folks wanting to see old Black Beauty standing on his back legs. Trucks backed up, security around the chutes making the folks stay back. News anchors whispered into their mics as to not to scare the wild beast that's fixing to come off the truck. Doors open, people gasping, nothing coming out. <laughs> All of a sudden, 
a burrow mother and a baby come walking out calmly. And the, cry, the crowd roared. <laughs> no black beauty was coming off that day. But since that time, many trucks have backed up to those chutes. And 20,000 horses and burros have found homes at that guinea pig center. And, and it's been a pleasure uh, being pioneers, working with the animals and the <coughs> vets and the adopters and the government folks. We, I guess we've worked with over 200 government folks and, and um, it, the group that we're working with now is, it, it, it's really got it, and and you all have grown to be out truly outstanding group of folks to to talk with. Um, and after that first day of opening, Randall and I decided we wanted this to be our life's work, and it's been amazing that all of the uh, east people would drive and bring their families. They would take vacations and. Just, it was really, really exciting. It was a positive approach for the adoption of the, ho the animals. Um, now we're finding homes for those people's children's children. So um, it, it's just been a real pleasant thing to do. But it had to get better. Um, the, I, I would think I've gone over on to about 900 satellite adoptions. And every adoption, it got worse and worse about uh, uh, they forgot to advertise or it, 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 something was happening. Something wasn't happening. Um, a lot of the folks that worked for BLM in the East uh, had job burnout. And so now when you go on a satellite, you're lucky if you adopt nine or ten. One minute. Oh. But, so anyway, we had to get the excitement going more, and and we've just uh, we're doing this with the Mustang Heritage Foundation, and um, and what I'm asking to, for you all to do because we have become the band aid for the adoption program, and we would like to, for you all to seek the additional funding for th that we're we're promised a thousand horses. Um, and we've only received funds enough to uh, find homes for 500. And we've already committed our adoption uh, programs the, to the event centers, to the uh, trainers. And so we need the, the rest of the funding. And we also want to go get on with the 4,000 horse and be promised to know that we can have that funding to get, uh, get it done. And then after that, we're looking to those 40,000 that are in, being held in the pens. We want to find homes for those. So, so we're here to do it for you. Just help us with the funding. Thank you. Thank you. So Carolyn Fulon, and then after Carolyn is Denise Balbal. She actually pronounced my last name correctly. Wow, that's the first one today. <laughs> All right, there, there is a reason for an attitude of distrust. Uh, I found this out personally about... Make sure well, you're speaking into the microphone. No, was, Sorry. Okay. Thanks. I'm a little short. Uh, February 5th, when I was doing um, equine affair uh, volunteer work, I, was, I found myself in a, a conversation with a young lady, and I didn't realize what booth I was at, but uh, I thought, uh-oh, maybe I'm talking to the wrong person, and <coughs> not really, though, but she was uh, Bureau of Land Management, and I uh, am not exactly for everything that they, they say here, and I'm a biologist, and um, the, the distrust part came when I mentioned an article, an essay by Ginger Catherine's, Death of the Calico Cult. This was published. Um, there was another one whose hooves, they were run so hard in the uh, roundup, and I'm another one for advocating stop the roundups at least for a while. They're 
damaging horses, killing them. There's other things kill them too in the roundups. Um, older horses, but here, if you could imagine the hooves parting company with the bone on these babies. Two of them laid, as I understand it, for two days on their sides waiting to be euthanized in agony. And uh, when I told this to the, about this article to this young lady at the BLM uh, booth, she very adamantly and loudly said that's an absolute lie. She said it a second time, and I can't remember what spurred that on something I, whoa, and I, I thought, well, I'm talking to the wrong person, I suppose, but now I realize it was, it was the right one, but I had to excuse myself from the conversation and, you know, lighten it up a little bit and leave because I was getting very upset, um, as anybody would if you, you read this essay and realize that <coughs> other than the figurative language, which is beautiful, uh, this is true. The animals' hooves, because they were so young, hadn't formed solidly yet, and they were run down gorges and rocks. And their hooves, actually, they were displaying raw nerves, nerve endings. One minute. Okay. Uh-oh, now I'm really gonna have to, to run. Okay. The National Horse Range in the Friar Mountains is in an interesting situation. It's, it's under the jurisdiction of the BLM. To the west is the jurisdiction of the Forest Service, and to the east of the National Horse Range uh, is the National Park Service. I have been a ranger with the Park Service. I've worked for the Forest Service. I have not worked for the BLM. Um, and 10 seconds. Okay, down to the bottom here. How about the situation of pain thought? I had, I'm going to do an outline. Thought, do animals think? Absolutely. I had a, had a mini horse and I have all types of documentation there. Pain Absolutely. He died a few weeks ago under somebody else's care. He was still a baby, pretty much. Thank you. But he died of colitis. And... Uh, Thank you. You could submit your comments to the master. Some emotion here. I'm still grieving, but I promise I won't cry until later. But, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Denise Bulbo? And then uh, Suzanne Roy is after. Well, first of all, I'd like to start off with the strategy document that you all are going to be making recommendations on. And basically, I think you need to take into account that, um, and I'm, I'm in the process, I've been waiting for four and a half months for my FOIA request to be answered to the BLM. I've asked for all the 9,000 comments that they say they've received because I have I, and I'm going to be able to prove it when I get these comments, that this strategy document does not accurately reflect the comments they received. I believe that they uh, selectively chose one off or comments that were received by a few and misrepresented them as representing the majority, and I think they undermined the majority opinions on many issues. So I think that that has to, that you need to take that into consideration. As soon as I get these public comments, um, we've also heard discrepancies about the number of comments they've received, so we're going to get to the bottom of that. But I, I really think that fundamentally this document is uh, flawed based on that. But being that <laughs> we have the document as it is, I'd like to urge this um, board to consider the following recommendations. Um, number one, for animal welfare, um, well, I obviously disagree with, you know, the glowing um, remarks that were made by the AHPA uh, observer program or pilot observer program uh, report. I think that you all should seriously consider and should recommend one of, the rec one of the recommendations that was made in that report, and I think it has great merit. And I don't think anyone here, no rancher's going to have a problem with this. 
we need video cameras on the helicopters, at the trap sites, at the processing centers. I mean, there's no reason that these, this agency shouldn't be accountable and that we shouldn't be able to see how our tax dollars are being used. I've talked to many ranchers out in the field when I've been at Roundups, and everybody says, you know, we might disagree on what should be done, but we agree you should have access and we agree you should be able to see what's going on. So I'm hoping that's a recommendation that this board will make. Also, on, um, with regards to the sustainable herds category, under the fertility control, and they call it fertility control and population suppression, I support fertility control. I think right now that what the agency is proposing, uh, 2,000 horses and with the removal of, you know, 7,600 for the next two years, that's, it's lopsided. It's upside down, to be quite frank. I mean, you can manage these horses on the range without removal. We need to stop the removals and we need to stop s continuing to dig the fiscal black hole of warehousing horses in government holding facilities. And, you know, when Renee was asking, um, I forgot her name, the, the acting director, um, about are you going to stop removals and how are you going to maintain an ecological balance? Well, I, I challenge, you know, well, why don't you all pay for long-term holding? Why don't all the ranchers go pick up the tab for $50 million a year and you pay for long-term holding since you all are the ones that want the removals? Um, number two. What? One minute and remember respecting each other's interests. And number two, with regards to fertility control and population suppression, I think, you know, the BLM has this tendency to say, oh, well, if you don't like what we do or you want us to round up in family bands, you need to give us scientific uh, peer-reviewed studies to show that family bands are important. Well, I want the scientific peer-reviewed studies that they base their sex ratio adjustments on. Where's the scientific studies that shows that sex ratios isn't having a devastating effect on the social and behavioral integrity of the wild horses on our range? And the, the, the department is responsible for maintaining their wild and free roaming behaviors. Where's your scientific evidence that that's not having a negative impact? And also with that same comment applies to sterilization. I mean, you all need to make recommendations that are not just to you know, you can pop do population control without it being sterilizing the horses and without um, doing sex ratios. Th you have PZP, and I think that we've seen it work. We know sanctuaries that use PZP. The reproduction rate is, I mean, the, it's 95% effective. And so I think we need to see more PZP being used and stop the removals. And then with regards to placing animals into private care, I urge you all, and this is a, something else, ranchers, because you all want to be fiscally conservative, I hope. Um, I do not think the agency should be giving financial incentives to get people to adopt horses. Um, and what it says in the strategy document is um, incentives to defray cost of horse ownership. You know, <laughs> if they Thank can't you. afford to have a horse, they shouldn't be um, taking a horse. They should not be being paid to take horses. Thank you. see Suzanne Roy oh, yeah. is there yeah, and then <laughs> after Suzanne is uh, Randy Helm okay I'm uh, Suzanne Roy and I represent the American Wild Horse Preservation Campaign which is a coalition of uh, over 40 organizations dedicated to preserving and protecting America's wild horses for generations to come um, <laughs> we're pleased with the new direction that the BLM um, is uh, putting out there in the new strategy document. But we caution that the public is, uh, needs some assurance that this strategy uh, represents more than words. Um, we all agree that long-term holding is not a long-term solution, um, but we're troubled by the fact that this strategy uh, continues the failed approach of mass removals of horses from the public lands with 32,800 horses projected for removal over the next um, five years. I'd like to also focus on recommendations that you might consider um, for your advisory board regarding the strategy document and the first one is regarding the comments as Denise mentioned we're concerned that the comments are not accurately reflected in the strategy document. Um, the comment number reported at 9,000. We know that many of our coalition partners asked their members to comment on the document, and we're, we, we can confirm that at least 50,000 emails 
were sent to the BLM to comment on this document. And that's not reflected in the strategy, and we will, as Denise said, be following up on that. Um, the other thing we'd like to, you to consider, consider recommend, recommending is um, asking for a quantitative analysis of the comments. The, um, <laughs> the BLM has uh, summarized the comments. Uh, troubling to me that the first three uh, suggestions offered as sort of an executive summary out of the first three, the first two are reduce AMLs and reduce the number of HMAs. Uh, that the horses live in, and I, I'm convinced that the majority of people did not recommend those two, two options. So we have very deep concern about the accuracy of the, uh, the way the comments are being reflected. Um, the second thing is uh, regarding sustainable herds. Again, everyone's talked about AML, and we, of course, agree that the program continues to be aimed at achieving an AML that is um, is uh, arbitrarily determined and um, based on an unfair allocation of resources in herd management areas to privately owned livestock. We'd like your committee to consider making a recommendation to um, the BLM to prioritize scarce funding uh, during this four-year period on fertility control, PZP, and adoption. I think, as uh, T Tim said, it, questionable priority to reduce the funding to the Mustang Heritage Fo Foundation, a program that works, and spend the funding to remove more horses and make the holding situation worse. So we'd like to consider that uh, prioritizing um, funding recommendation, as well as re you know, uh, making sure that the NAS actually does look at the foundational aspects of the program, which are One. the AMLs and the forage allocations. One minute. The campaign would also like to, uh, you to uh, recommend as well regarding transparency um, that cameras be installed. As Denise said, there's, that's really uh, you know, I, what I would consider a no-brainer. And that um, the holding facilities that are closed be opened periodically to the public. I think you would find that a lot of the um, controversy would go away if people could actually see what's going on there and, and uh, track which horses are there. And so I'd, I'd love to see you make a recommendation regarding transparency. And then finally, I'd like to focus on partnerships. Um, you know, we have, the government has a moral and fiscal responsibility to care for the horses that we've already removed from the range. Um, and I don't think that there should be any um, uh, thought that we can pass this problem off to private nonprofit charities. I'll just finish quickly. But I'd like to see um, a recommendation that uh, the BLM um, cultivate promising partnerships, <coughs> such as Mrs. Pickens' partnership that offers something back to the taxpayer, as opposed <laughs> just as another long-term holding contract where the the um, motivation is profit. This is something that will return the money to the horses and to the land. And I'd like the BLM to prioritize that. Perhaps you could recommend that. And also to look at partnerships that would not only uh, deal with holding horses that have already been removed from the range, but also offer model programs for managing horses on the range. And Return to Freedom, in partnership with a rancher in Nevada, has offered a program that could serve as a pilot for other um, areas, other herd management areas. And so I'd love you all to recommend um, looking at partnerships that, that talk about how to keep horses on the range instead of house the ones that are already removed. Thank you. Thank you. Randy Helm, and then after Randy is uh, Melanie Kate Mason. Thank you. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm from Arizona, so, so I don't know, I don't have anything to say about all the, the, the gathers, and uh, uh, I, I don't uh, have an opinion on that. I'm probably somewhere in Switzerland on some of the other issues as well. I was raised on a cattle ranch, and I hunt big game, so uh, uh, I, I can see that you guys have an enormous job. I certainly wouldn't want it. Uh, we have a, a lot of uh, great passionate uh, organizations uh, here that uh, I, I think most of them agree that something needs to be done to, to better the lives of the horses. Uh, my experience personally has been that uh, one of the greatest advocacy organizations, at least here, is, is the BLM, the, uh, as far as uh, really being very conscientious about the horses and we don't say much about the burrows but Arizona 
uh, really needs a lot uh, with the borough program. I've been, uh, uh, my experience with the uh, wild horse program, I've been training wild horses since about 1993. I'm involved with the uh, Mustang Heritage Foundation as a tip trainer. And uh, I want to encourage this uh, committee to, uh, as, as you look at the budgeting, to uh, encourage the budgeting to move in the area of adoptions. And the Mustang Heritage Foundation is doing a great job. I don't, I don't know that we can have uh, one and not the other. Um, I hear things said about no gatherings, and uh, the reality, in my opinion, is if there are no gatherings, then eventually the herds are going to be larger than the range to sustain the herds, and the first people that are going to be blamed for that is going to be back to the BLM for not doing a better job of, of protecting the animals. Uh, I would, would encourage you to uh, fund and, and promote the adoptions. I don't know how to accomplish some of the media challenges, but uh, we recently had an adoption in Apache Junction and had just very positive media coverage and had, uh, I think, some of the, the better turnouts that we've had in a long time. So, you know, when the media uh, gets behind some of that, and, and I know that's a challenge within itself, and also to be able to increase the viability of trained, qualified volunteers within the program. And uh, I, I think if there was some funding going into not just finding volunteers, but actually equipping them to be effective in uh, reducing some of the, the workload. So thank you. Would you state thank your you. name again, please? Sir? It was Randy who? Helm. 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 So, Helm. Melanie Kate Helm. Mason, and then next, next would be Annie Mon. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Melanie Kate Mason, and I came down from Oregon to to speak on behalf of the horses, and thank uh, all of you on the board for all the work that you're doing and your concern for the best practices for our horses and burros on our wild properties. Um, I am a businesswoman in Oregon. I am also a volunteer with the Wild Horse and Burrow Program and have been also a volunteer as a cultural anthropologist collecting oral histories. So, and I'm with the Backcountry Horsemen of Oregon. We clear the trails from all the trees that come down so everybody can get through on our public lands. So I have a real passion for vo being a volunteer, for doing what's right, and for giving back to our public lands, which is, which is all of our lands. These, these are our lands for our grandchildren and beyond. And it is um, our stewardness, our stewardship, that will maintain that for the future, of course. And so with that, a couple of points I wanted to um, also thank the BLM in Oregon. They do a stellar job. Everybody just does whatever they can for the horses there. But we do need shelter for horses in corrals. I've been to other corrals as well. And having some shelter where they can get out of the sun, it gets very, very hot. Of course, we have a lot of snow up where we are and in other areas, other holding areas. Um, and then there was also a comment to provide water out in the wilderness for the horses. That is just a humane thing to do, and we, uh, we talked today about the humane treatment of our horses. And a society is, of course, looked at how we treat our elderly, our children, and our animals. And I think we've done a real good job of that, and we want to continue to do that and to, tr and to have humane treatment for our wild animals and our public lands. Um, we are speaking today on behalf of our national symbol of freedom that along with the bald eagle. I am very fortunate to be able to look out my window and every day watch a pair of bald eagles and my wild Mustang, and I just feel so grateful. And so many people, I, I'm out in the public talking to them about the wild horses. You know, they're darn right the smartest horse out there. They are very, very aware. And uh, really, we help to bring the wild horses to the public 
so the public can pet them, ride them, educate the public about them, and so to educate the public so that they are interested, the comment was made, how do we, um, you know, is there a public interest to ad adopt what's collected? There can be if we educate them that this is, these horses are jumpers, dressage, western, reining horses, very, very capable, as well as being a trail horse that takes you safely down the road, through the rivers, and, and beyond. So humane treatment, having water out there, um, and enough forage and feed for the horses as well. Um, I would, I would say as a businesswoman, um, we need to treat this, uh, have accountability with the BLM, that they, uh, you know, if I have a business and I fail, that is my American right. And so, you know, the cattle people and all these other businesses that are being uh, subsidized, they have a right to fail as well. American taxpayers do not need to support that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Annie Mond is next, and after Annie, it is Laura Lee. Um, <clears throat> this has already been said at least twice, and it bears repeating. With or without the money, stop all the roundups now. Give the horses and burrows their original acres back. Increase the horse AMLs. Decrease the cattle AMLs. Fire Sanjay and the Coutures. Use humane roundup methods. Start being transparent. Give us access to everything, all the time. Start being accountable for every single horse. Record data correctly. Leave untouched and undamaged herds. Start using acceptable scientific methods. Make the holding facilities humane. Give them shelter. Stop acting like you are pest control for ranchers, mining industries, hydraulic fracturing industries. Start acting like an agency in charge of preserving and protecting the last of our remaining wild horses and burrows. Stop disgracing America. Stop all roundups now. And I'm going to add something. The planet is the prophet. 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 All these earthquakes. Storms and warming tell me now's the time to rock it. The earth is surely dying, and the wolves, bears, jaguars, coyotes, eagles, wild horses, and burros being killed. The poor man's getting poorer while the rich man's bank is filled. The planet is the prophet. 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 Who is going to tell us? of the way to go from here. What message must be spoken that the arrogant human race must hear? The aliens from outer space may come here now and then, but the burdens on the human race to know the truth again. The planet is the prophet. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Laura Lee, and after Laura, it's um, Kathy Lees. Hi again. And again, and again, and again. <laughs> I'm Laura Lee. I'm here today for Grassroots Horse. Um, I've spoken to this board countless times. Um, you know, sometimes half of you look asleep. Many of you don't look in our direction. Nothing changes on the ground. Um, I come to you from a year of being out there witnessing more roundups than any government personnel, more roundups than anyone from any organization that you send as a humane observer. I can tell you that when your observers show up, protocol on the ground changes, actions on the ground changes. What you see is not real. It's not what occurs, it's, it's crafted, it's words, it's not the actions. 
saw Tim at, at uh, Twin Peaks for a day or two, but the faces up here I've never seen in the field or at a roundup. You take the words, but not what's real. And I can tell you there's a tremendous contradiction between what you read and what really happens. I'm gonna tell you a little story. Antelope, let's just look at antelope. I arrive at antelope prior to the beginning of the roundup. I go out and I do a range assessment of forage of numbers of horses. The horses present don't reflect what was in that EA. I go to the wild horse and burrow specialist and he says to me, you're right, Laura. It's true, they're not there, they've moved. Okay, so then why are we gonna do the roundup? You guys are running out of money. Right now we're, we're being told you don't have enough money to move forward with, the, with protocol, with the roundups for the next half of the fiscal year. So why isn't an assessment being done and this portion of the roundup that's gonna cost a lot of money called off? Half that roundup was done where an entire work day was spent gathering less than 30 horses a day. We didn't reach the numbers that you guys expected to reach again at another large roundup. The number of horses are not there, no matter what it says on your paper. And now you're out of money because you proceeded with a roundup where the first half of the roundup is spent removing horses off of grazing allotments where you don't even wait until the horses are removed before you start moving the cattle out. The number of horses aren't there. The forage was present. It was present to support the number of horses that were on that land and the full crop. But you went in and spent more than half the budget for the antelope complex roundup on a roundup that didn't need to happen. And that's what's happening on the ground out there. And those roundups are not being done in a humane fashion. I'm going to give you another what? little piece. One 10 to 20 stallions in a pen. One 40-gallon Rubbermaid container for water. Do the math. <coughs> this isn't rocket science. This isn't the most up-to-date science. It's common sense, and it doesn't exist on the range. Thank you. <coughs> so I believe we have uh, three more speakers, and I'll check at the end. Um, next up is Kathy Lease, then Kathleen Waddle, and D. Camillo. And I would like us to remind ourselves of the respect rule. Um, we're all here because we're passionate, but we also <coughs> want to be able to hear each other. And I want to remind you that this is the advisory board, not BLM. <coughs> so. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Kathy Lease, um, and this issue is important enough to me that I took time off from work both yesterday and today and have driven a very long time uh, to come here to ask that the BLM stop the ongoing assault of our national treasure, <coughs> the wild horses, and I'm asking that the roundups cease. For several years now, I've been reading about and watching the government wipe out our American Mustangs. Wild horses are an American icon and part of the delicate natural balance in our Western vistas. The BLM has ignored Congress and the people of this country at the behest of oil companies and cattle con conglomerates who are using the land designated to protect the Mustangs for their own private purposes. Our tax dollars are working for these special interest groups and not the wild horses. President Obama promised this country that he would run an administration that would not only listen but act on what Americans had to say. But the Bureau of Land Management's performance thus far has been the opposite of that promise. The BLM's current policies include inhumane methods of gathering and confining our wild horses. For example, during the Calico Roundup in Nevada, 90 wild horses died and more than 40 mares lost their late-term foals. Interestingly, the BLM reported this as a success. Other examples would be documented cases of newborn foals being chased by helicopters until their hooves literally came off, leaving them to die a horrible and very painful death. Pregnant mares who abort foals in late-term pregnancies, horses that are trampled and killed during the roundups, or chased into places <coughs> causing them to break their necks and legs. One of the most recent and heinous examples 
was the fall photographed with his umbilical cord still hanging, ripped from his mother, literally breathing its first breath and then being chased by helicopters. I, I, I doubt the mayor or Fall survived, and it, it doesn't take a policy analyst to understand that this is just plain wrong and inhumane. Um, no animal should have to endure the type of terror that these animals go through during these roundups. The assault on the wild horses is not what Americans want, and we've, we've been stating it loudly. The special interest groups may have deep pockets, but they do not represent the American majority. In the same areas where federally protected horses were removed at great expense because the BLM stated that there were too many horses to be supported by the area, cows were dropped off to graze and give birth. So, you know, which is it? Um, the government agency that should be upholding the law of the land, the Wild Free Roaming Horses and Burrows Act, is killing in a way an American treasure, our wild mustangs. It is the most extreme irony that we are here today trying to defend our wild horses from the very people who have been entrusted to watch over them. Since, two since 2001, the BLM has removed more than 90,000 wild horses off their federally protected land. More than 25 million acres have been withdrawn from the wild horse and burrows, despite the 1971 legislation making this protected land. More than 36,000 horses are incarcerated in holding facilities that don't even begin to house them humanely instead of roaming free on the very land designated for their protection. Um, all of this is leading to the extinction of the wild horses and burrows in America, the land of the free. It is my highest hope that I will be able to witness our country's return to its best ideals, and by that I mean listening and responding to Americans and stopping the roundups. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kathleen Waddle, and then last will be Dee Camillo, and I'll make sure that I've got everybody. I'm gonna speak, I'm gonna speak on public outreach science and research and sustainable herds. In its strategy, BLN recommends, recommits to transparency and proposes to provide public tours to the range, to roundups, short-term holding, and to host annual and periodic tours of long-term holding. This is not acceptable. Americans want full access to see all of our wild horses wherever BLM houses them and whenever we'd like to see them. Within reason, such as Monday through Friday, nine to five when staff is there. But definitely, we do not want, want this access via one-off tours every so many months. Unconscionably, Approximately 40,000 of our horses have been removed from our public lands and are now secreted away as if they were some kind of top secret project. Worse, these facilities are the only places left to reliably see formerly wild horses. Americans want to see wild horses in the wild. We want to see family bands with their wild behaviors on display, not in pens. After over two years of accelerated roundups, wild horse lovers visiting HMAs are consistently reporting that even after extensive searching, they cannot find herds of horses in the wild. Make the effort, invest the time and the money, and perhaps you won't even see a horse. It's ludicrous when you will surely see cows. <laughs> Americans have been stripped of our rights to view and enjoy our very own animals on our own wild lands. And instead, BLM keeps them hidden away under lock and key. Who does this serve? Certainly not the American public. And this proposed strategy does not address this issue in any meaningful way. For years, BLM has contract contracted with equine geneticists who advise that the minimum gen genetic viability is 150 individuals. Why pay experts and then ignore their advice? When you look at AMLs, about 80% of the HMAs are set mm. below genetic viability of 150. What does this say? that BLM is not serious about keeping herds viable 
and they may even be willfully whittling down the AML so that they can use the excuse there are not enough to remain viable, so we'll just zero out this herd. This is exactly what was happened in the proposal for the West Douglas herd in Colorado in 2010. One minute. Furthermore, part of this equation is the reduction in resectioning of HAs into HMAs and the fencing. This results in the removal of traditional pastures. In other words, the genetic non-viability was caused by BLM's decisions to cut down the land area and cut down the AML. My response, BLM needs to, take, to reverse their own bad decisions and not take it out on the wild horses and on Americans by simply obliterating another herd. Americans want these animals to remain as iconic expressions of the traits of freedom, strength, grace, beauty, and resilience to inspire many future generations in the wild. That requires safeguarding the genetics through managing herd sizes that experts say are required seconds. and providing enough land mass for viable herds. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is uh, D. Camillo, and then I wanted to re-ask if Marta Williams was back because she was skipped over earlier. Good morning. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I've uh, driven 15 mi uh, hours from New Mexico. I'm a professor of history and of um, art, and I love wild horses and... Um, I read a lot about the ecosystem, so I would like to present something that shows a larger picture of what is not going on with the BLM's removal of the horses. A healthy ecosystem is comprised of fauna and flora, <clears throat> which work in a complex exchange of foraging and hunting, an exchange which continues to recreate itself. Throughout natural history, human interference has rendered ecosystems ineffective. Our continued existence of human, animal, and plant life is dependent upon healthy ecosystems. The clearest perspective of the species which literally creates its own ecosystem is the beaver of the far north in Canada. He breaks down toxins in the water, reduces the risk of flooding, and restores wetlands. The beaver's molding action of large banks of dirt further encourage the growth of poplars and willow trees. Just as the beaver is critical to his ecosystem, the predator and prey cycle of the wild burrows and horses create a healthy western landscape. In reference to the predator and prey cycle, compelling evidence is offered by the University of Nevada's Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Sciences. Mountain lines are radio collared and subsequently tracked and researched. Their current findings state that, quote, the importance of mountain lines and their inter interactions with prey, especially wild horses, are critical components of rangeland and mountain ecosystems. Um, in view of healthy ecosystems, I have three uh, suggestions for the BLM. Uh, the BLM must, as the 1971 law clearly states, view the wild horses and burrows as integral to their landscape and ecosystem. Um, I refer you to Bruce Wagner, uh, Wagman rather. He, uh, he is a law partner in Schiff and Hayden. He wrote the book Animal Law, Cases and Materials. He contends that the BLM often acts in non-compliance with the accurate and complete data, especially for referring to its zeroing out policy. He says, quote, the BLM is required to consider the horses in their herds area as an integral part of the natural system, i.e. the ecosystem and landscape of our public lands. Wagman continues to state that no agency interpretation of, quote, integral to the landscape can justify considering horses in a herd um, as eliminating them. Okay, so number one, I think that uh, we need to look at wild horses and burrows in their landscape. Number two, the, B the BLM should halt roundups unless so sound scientific backing and accurate numbers rationalize those roundups. Additionally, all roundups should end in adoptions, not holding pens, and the BLM should seriously consider working with offers of eco sanctuary. According to Wagman, decisions are currently based on old data from 1971, not current data as required by law. 
Uh, number three, the Wild Horse and Burrow Act states that the BLM shall not use, quote, harassing tactics or acts which end in the, quote, death of these animals. Footage provided to the public of helicopter roundups are unconscionable. Individual burrows and horses are literally, literally sometimes, but one time is often enough, hit by helicopters. Images of dead foals are abhorrent. These are young foals which are run ragged to their painful deaths with hooves separated from their legs. These animals are sentient beings with physical and psychological feelings, with family, with a right to a dignified life. We are United States citizens. We should be much better than this. Where is our hu humanity? I ask that all facets of the Department of the Interior take seriously the 1971 words of Congress, wild free roaming horses and burrows are living symbols of the historic and pioneer spirit of the West. They contribute to the diversity of human life within the nation and enrich the lives of the American people. Thank you.